and welcome to Renewed Mind. I'm your host, Rommel Gassane, and today we have with us Bob Mendelssohn from Jews for Jesus, who will be discussing with us Christ in the Passover. First of all, welcome to the show, Bob. Thanks, Rommel. Shalom. Thank you. What is all this stuff, Bob? Now, we're going to be discussing Christ in the Passover, but I don't know what all this stuff is. Well, we're going to talk about that in this episode. We're going to talk about how Jewish people celebrate the Passover today, which happens every year about April. It happens on a rotation with the lunar cycle. So it's not always fixed like March 13th or April 7th. It, it varies. And we're going to talk about how Jesus celebrated the Passover mm. and how he instituted what Christians call Holy Communion right from this sacred festival. Wow. And we'll see where else the episode takes us. But that's where those are my plans. Very good. So if I can start off initially and ask you, what is the Passover feast, biblically in, speaking? In the book of Exodus, chapter 12, God tells Moses to tell the Jewish people that after a full year of plagues that have come upon the Egyptians, he says, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. Speak to the congregation of Israel on the 10th of this month everyone take a lamb for themselves mm. and gather and keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill that lamb at twilight. Not one lamb, but one lamb for each of the households of the Jewish people. Think there were three or four million Jewish people living in this region of Egypt called Goshen. So you, you're supposed to share together, the Bible says, when you eat this meal, which means there are probably 300,000 homes. So 300,000 lambs are killed. Wow. This is not one lamb for the church. This is not just a church picnic. This is three, three million Jewish people yes. being redeemed from slavery. That's the point of Exodus. That's the point of the story of Passover. When the angel of death passes over the houses, passes over the houses of the Jewish people when we were possibly going to hit with the last of the 10 plagues, which was the destruction or the killing of the firstborn. Mm. So God says, take a lamb, put the blood on the doors, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it, if a Jew had not put blood on the door in the appropriate way, his firstborn would have been dead. This wow. was the first of the 10 plagues that could have hit the Jewish people. So this was a judgment. It was a judgment. Why? He says, uh, well, it says, in fact, right here in the text, uh, I will pass through the land, verse 12, of Egypt on that night, and I'll strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will mm. execute judgment. I am the Lord, sort of signed God. So the judgment was against the false deities who'd been raised up against the true God, the Pharaoh and the, the, the water, uh, the, the, the Nile itself was a God to the Egyptian people. All kinds of things were assaulted by God in the plagues to say those gods, gods aren't God. There's only one God. So when God said, here, I'm going to execute judgment against all the deities, the false deities, if the Egyptians said, well, these are still our gods, then they were going to cop the judgment. Mm. But if an Egyptian had put blood on the door in the appropriate manner, his children would have been spared. So it wasn't genealogy, whether Jewish or Egyptian, that saved the, anybody. It was the blood that saved the people. Yes, yes. I mean, I've always thought to myself that, you know, the, the plagues, the, the other nine plagues, I mean, they were quite severe, but they weren't quite as severe as this last one, which God would send. Uh, the others, uh, I mean, it's quite possible that families could escape, but it was now God saying... Sort of. Uh, certainly they lasted for only for a short time. Water turned to blood, frogs, yes. uh, lice, darkness. These, these were things that happened just for a few days. Mm. But the loss of your firstborn, it that's was, permanent. That's right. It was going to affect every single family. Yeah. That's quite serious. Now, I'm hoping perhaps you can explain, uh, I mean, these items that you've brought in and their symbolism and their meaning to us, please. The, the way that Jewish people celebrate today is pretty standard worldwide, though there is variation when a Jewish person will 
celebrate in Moscow or in Melbourne, Victoria, or in Morocco, they'll have different foods, of course, and there'll be different traditions. Almost always, the house is brightened up by the mother of the house lighting candles to bring light to the festival of our redemption. And it's fitting that a woman lights the lights, one, because she can do it and I can't, and because the fan is going. It's fitting that a woman should light the lights, for it wasn't the will of man, and it wasn't the seed of man that brought light to the world, but the will of God through the seed of woman, mm. that true light, true redemption has come to all mankind. Now we have four cups up here. Each member of the family would only have one cup in front of him. And it's filled, though, four times with wine. A full cup of, in Judaism represents the fullness of joy. So we drink four times, and I'll just use those four cups to indicate that, but of course in front of each person is only one Boy, cup. Yes. And each cup represents a different aspect of the redemption that God bought for us in Egypt. The first is the cup of sanctification, the second the cup of plagues, the third the cup of redemption, that's the focal point of the whole evening, and the cup of praise is number four. So those kind of pace us through the evening. It's celebrated at night, that's why you light the candles. It is celebrated as a family reunion in modern days. It is a religious ceremony, so we use a special book called the Haggadah. Uh, we read through prayers and songs and Bible passages and tell the story. It's a reunion and we eat a giant meal. Mom's been cooking for weeks. <laughs> so is this very similar to what Jesus and the disciples did in the upper room? In fact, when you say the upper room, it would have been at the place in the Bible. In Luke chapter 22, we read that he sent two of his disciples out to go and make ready for this very feast. It says in the scripture that he sent two of the disciples to go and make ready. And they said, where do you want us to prepare it? He said, behold, when you've entered the city, you'll see a man there carrying a pitcher of water. Really? <laughs> In a city teeming with hundreds of thousands, perhaps, of tourists and Very pilgrims. Vague. You're going to see a man carrying a pitcher of water? Ah, because women carried water. Oh. So a man carrying water, maybe he's single. Okay. Maybe he'd understand why 12 single guys <laughs> want to have Passover together. We're not sure. <laughs> but he'd be recognizable. You'll see a man there carrying a pitcher of water, follow him into the house that he enters and tell the owner of that house, the teacher, the master says to you, where's the guest room? Where I'll eat the Passover with my disciples and he'll show you a large furnished upper room, prepare it there. Mm. So they went and they found it every, just exactly as Jesus had told them and that's where they prepared the Passover. Mm. This idea of preparing for the Passover is significant and major. So you'll see in Jewish homes, back in Kansas City where I grew up and here in Sydney and around the globe, you'll see Jewish people who will uh, spend weeks cleaning the house, spring cleaning. Weeks? Weeks. So this is not something that's done the night before? It, it, yes and no. Yes, it can be, that would be the minimum, but it can be time to take out all the, because it's early spring up mm -hmm. north. So it's time to get all the winter stuff out and put the spring summer clothes out. It's time to change some of the, the draperies. It's time to change, certainly we have to change the stemware and the dinnerware mm -hmm. and all the kitchen stuff because on Passover you don't use the same things in the kitchen, the dishes and pots and the pans that you use during the regular year because here in Exodus 12, it tells us that we're not even allowed to see any leaven, any yeast in our houses for seven days. Mm. So you gotta get rid of anything like a pan that has fried up some French toast. Yes. Even though in modern days, there's probably no vestige of that bread, therefore the leaven in that pan, still out of respect, we get rid of, I mean, we don't throw it away. We just move it out of the house for a week and then bring it back in later. And why leaven? You know, it, it says not to, you shouldn't, and so that's it, that's the reason. But then you gotta wonder, why did God say that? That's such an odd thing. He talks about it in terms of the speed by which we were delivered out of Egypt, really by the, what we would call, God coming through at 11.59. Mm. God coming through at just the right time. Mm. When you think about it, we were slaves for 400 years. Moses comes home on the 10th of the month and says, pack up, 
Call the real estate agent. We're leaving in four days. Well, the women didn't have time to put the yeast, the leaven, into the dough and wait for it to rise. So they took the dough as it was, put it into the oven, pulled it out. It looked more like tortillas or pita bread than it did the big old puffy white bread of Da Vinci's Last Supper. So in the Old Testament, unleavened bread speaks of haste or speed or the deliverance from Egypt at a timely fashion. Mm. So uh, leaven throughout the Bible, though, carries different significances. And certainly many Christians would say leaven is a symbol of sin, the way it pervades the lump. Mm. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that we should get rid of leaven out of our community. And by that, he's talking about a particular fellow who's sexually sleeping with his stepmother. Mm. That's not kosher behavior, he says. <laughs> and he says that because Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He says there's only one person in the entire human record who's unleavened mm. without sin, and that's the Lord Jesus. Wow. Because he died and rose and dwells within the whole community of faith, he, like the king of the kingdom of heaven, is pervading us like leaven with his unleavenedness. Mm. It's, it's a mixed metaphor, I apologize. And if you were an English teacher, you'd take six <laughs> points off my score. But it is wonderful the way the apostle does that to say that the Messiah is going to pervade us with his righteousness. So in the Older Testament, unleavened bread spoke of haste. In the Newer Testament, it speaks of holiness. Mm. And so then if you could take us through the process of how the feast is celebrated. I'm wearing a white robe. Yes. The, yes. the father of the house, not everybody at the house, wears a, a different dress. We eat different clothes. We're eating on different plates. We set it apart. Is that because it's special? It this is. is a special, okay. Hugely special. And it was, you don't go very far in the record of the Older Testament before you see, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Mm. It's sort of like his spiritual nickname. Mm. This God who so identifies in the record of scripture with that Passover event that he wanted to seal it in the Jewish community. It's also prophetic. That is that the Passover about a lamb is going to be about another Passover 1,500 years later mm. when the Lamb of God is going to come. But most Jewish people today, we celebrate the Passover. The father or grandfather will wear a white robe, a symbol of priesthood and royalty, a skull cap, of course, maybe even a mitre or a beretta, some kind of different clothing, different foods, different altogether so that we don't forget. In Exodus 12, it tells us in around verse 26, 27, when your children ask you, why are we doing this? Mm. Then you shall say to them, this is because of what the Lord did for us when he delivered our homes. So I tell my children, and I've got three, and now grandchild, please God, grandchildren, uh, when, when they say, hey pop, why are we doing this? I'll say, because it's what God did for me and you and you little one and your little ones. In other words, own this thing. It's not just a dusty old tale about some event that some Jews did back then. So this was done in remembrance to jog someone's memory of what God did for you personally. It's a memorial. And as a people. Sure. Uh -huh. You know, a lot of Christians at Easter time sing the song, Were You There? Mm. The old hymn, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? All that does is it takes you back to the time of the Passion. Mm -hmm. What Passover does is it rewinds us 1,500 more years to the time of the Exodus. So we can say we were there. So we eat odd foods. The appetizers include parsley and onion and uh, the parsley dipped in salt water and onion and horseradish. Ooh, yeah. oh my. My grandmother used to take a horseradish root and grind it up and pour in vinegar and for about a block and a half, you knew it was Passover. It was severe. It's like Jewish uh, nasal cleanser. I mean, it's, you eat that stuff <laughs> and you'll remember. But the Bible tells us we're supposed to eat three things on that night. Exodus 12 tells us in verse 8, we're supposed to eat Paschal lamb with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. Those are the three requirements. So the bitter herbs we use are the, is the horseradish. 
Mm -hmm. Then we mix it with some apple mixture, and that makes it a lot easier to swallow. We have an egg sliced, and it represents temple sacrifice. We dip that in the salt water. So there's a lot of different things we eat, appetizers. And again, those are pretty standard worldwide. The main dishes that come in later might be a little different. So why are the herbs that you eat bitter? Mm, to remind us that our life was made bitter by Pharaoh and by okay. the Egyptians uh -huh. and the taskmasters and the whole idea of the house of bondage. We are remembering that we were there. So you can appreciate the freedom that you have now. In fact, you can't know freedom unless you remember that from which you've been delivered. Mm, that's interesting. So we actually, we've sanctified the table and we've drunk the first cup. When we drink the second cup, before we do that, we take with our finger or a spoon 10 drops out of the cup and put them on our platter. Every person at the table does that. Why? Because our joy is diminished when we remember the suffering even of our enemies. Mm. So we have 10 drops, one for each of the plagues that befell the Egyptians, then we drink it. It's good to remember that. And the last item on this, this is the Seder plate. This would be hanging in Jewish homes worldwide throughout the year, but once a year it's brought down onto the table and we put the egg and the parsley and all these things on the, the plate, the Seder plate. And the last item on there is a shank bone of a lamb. And this is a special memory of the Paschal lambs we were, by which we were saved those, that, that night of Passover. And that stands powerfully there on our Seder plate. It reminds us of that deliverance. Mm. You know, when you think about it, we were instructed to put blood on the door, on the two side posts, it says, and the lintel, that's the top of the frame. It would drip back down from the top so that effectively all four edges of the door were sealed from the angel of death who would pass over. It's not exactly clear how they painted it. I mean, they used blood mm. and they used a bunch of hyssop to paint it. So it's not exactly the most precise of brushes. But when you think about it, they painted it on the two doorposts and then again the lintel from which it would drip back down. So it's almost as if it's in the shape of a cross. Mm. Certainly the blood would drip in that way. Was that predictive? Was that something that foreshadowed something to come? Maybe, and I certainly will give it to you if you see that. But it was the blood that saved the Jews. It wasn't our religion, it wasn't our dignity, it wasn't our intense intelligence. It was God looking down and seeing blood from lambs. So that blood essentially provided protection and safety for the occupants of that home? And only those, uh -huh. that's right. So if your kid was outside playing, when the angel of death came through, he's a goner. Wow. Yeah, so wow. you had to be inside the house and you had to let that blood be your testimony. And imagine it a decade later when some nomads would wander through the land of Goshen and they'd see this ghost town of a village where three million Jews used to live a decade yes. earlier. They'd say, what happened here? And the blood would continue to testify mm. that the Jews were saved by the blood of lambs. So lamb is pretty significant. The problem today is that we read in Exodus 12 that it, we're supposed to eat lambs. But we don't, most Jews don't eat anymore. We just have the bone. Why? Because we don't have a temple into which to bring the sacrifice. Mm. So we represent the temple sacrifice with the lamb, mm. shank, the bone itself. So they can't actually get a lamb and, and kill it and then draw the blood from it and eat the meat of it because it has to actually go to a temple. This is yeah, the well, that's what, preventative. That's what they say. I mean, certainly I eat lamb. I uh -huh. love testifying on Passover about what God did through the lamb. But there, and Sephardi tradition, the Spanish Jewish tradition, allows for the eating of lamb. But there are some in the Ashkenaz, the Germanic Jewish tradition, that doesn't allow that. Mm. And, and that's pretty much worldwide as well. And so the, the uh, candlesticks, what do they represent? You know, back in the day, probably, the meal started in the evening. It was dark. They didn't have electricity. <laughs> It's quite practical. It was a practical uh -huh. thing. I think today we make a big deal about the this representation that the candles bring, but mostly it was just for light. Mm -hmm. Even though they say you're not supposed to use it for light, everybody uses candles for light. For light, light yes. Yeah. So that's my guess, and it was a, 
a, a, a leftover from a need back before electricity. So then how would they eat the um, items, the dips that were in the plate? Yeah, well, the plate. well, we also have matzahs. Uh -huh. Matzahs, that's the unleavened bread. Okay. It looks like crackers. And we do, we eat the, all the items with the matzah. That's it. And this is just a broken piece. Don't eat it, uh -huh. but you can have Thank some. Thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll eat it later. Yeah. <laughs> Yum. I mean, look at this. this we got to eat this for eight straight days. Wow. Yeah, you know, you're kind of saying, you know, after the first day and a little bit of sauce and a little bit of vegetable it's dip. It's not too bad. Yeah, but after two, three, four days, peanut butter and jam, you know, you kind of say, you know, let me get some bologna. How do, you, how do you get all this in here? But we use matzahs, unleavened bread. This is probably not the way it looked back in the days of Jesus, but it is the way the rabbis require it to look today with the stripes and, and the piercing on it. It's got holes in it. It's perforated. This is Again, probably not the way it looked back in the days of Yeshua, but it is the way that the children are taught in Jewish schools today. Mm. How to bake it 18 minutes and then it puffs up and then you run over it with like pizza cutter. Mm. It's like that, the way they do it. Manufactured, of course, in Brooklyn and Israel and all kinds of places around the globe. So we eat matzahs. This is the, the third of the three required items, unleavened bread, bitter herbs and lamb. Those were what we were supposed to eat. All the rest get added in, of course, traditions. We know how that happens. <laughs> uh, but matzahs, matzah means unleavened bread. Now we do a ceremony at the beginning of the Seder that I find fascinating. And I'll draw your attention to it. And it is using this. This is called a matzah tash. Matzah meaning unleavened bread, tash meaning pocket. And it's really three pockets in one. So you can see one, two, three compartments in this one bag. Three at one, don't get ahead of me. This is called the matzah tash. And we, we take the middle matzah, sometimes square, sometimes wow. round, always flat. You can see it's got stripes mm -hmm. and it's perforated. We break it somewhat in half. Half is returned to the middle portion of the matzah tash. And the other half is wrapped traditionally in a white cloth. Mm. It gets a new name, which is a Greek word, afikomen. It means that which comes later, or dessert. Yum. <laughs> <laughs> this is dessert? <laughs> Please. Maybe that's why I like pavlova. <laughs> and we're, we, the father buries it somewhere in the house. And after the meal, the children run around. They love that part. Nobody yells at them. And they come back and they find it. They're very happy because the rabbis say that the afikoman now represents the lamb that was brought in the original Exodus. Mm -hmm. Therefore, every member of the family has to eat of this piece. You don't eat of this piece. You have not fulfilled any of the obligations of the Seder. Mm -hmm. You offend in one point, you're guilty of all. Mm -hmm. So you're the kid, you found it. They're the family, they need it. So you sell it back to dad for some pocket change <laughs> and he distributes it to the rest of the family. And well, that was a lot of fun when I was a kid. Now I'm the dad yeah. and the granddad and my children hold out for currency, <laughs> large currency, airplane tickets. That's all right. Now you go to a rabbi in your neighborhood and ask what this three yet one matzah tash stands for. And he might come up with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob or Kohen, Levi, Yisrael, the priests, the Levites, the Israelites. But that doesn't satisfy me. Why three? Why broken? Why this striped and pierced mm. and buried Interesting, and brought yes. back? So I look at that as a representation of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Wow. So that the middle one would be the Lord Yeshua, Jesus, who was broken for us on the cross. The prophet Isaiah said the Messiah would be, by his stripes, we'd be healed. The prophet Zechariah said, we the Jewish people would look on him whom we had pierced and we'd mourn as one mourns for an only son. Mm. When they took him down from the cross, they wrapped him, if you will, in a white shroud and buried him from our eyes. Mm. To most of my Jewish people, that's still where he is. Mm. Jesus was a man, a good man, prophet, teacher, rabbi, but just a man. The end of all men is death. The end of death is the grave. They, like you, believe Jesus died, Jesus was buried. There's something else. Yes, Come on, Bob, finish that story. Was not without, raised, yes. without that resurrection, yes. we're hopeless. There's no salvation. Yes. No, we're empty. But because he rose from the dead, there's mm. a great joy, not only for us 
who have discovered him, but for those to whom we pass this on and they wow. get in on for it as well. For everyone, yes. For anyone. So it's available not just for the family who have half a piece of matzah, but we break it and pass it on. And whoever will comes and takes freely wow. from whatever God wants to provide. So this symbol of the matzatash is pretty remarkable. At the end of the Seder, after the meal, remember the meal comes in between cups two and three. At the meal, after that, we buy the afikoman back from the kids. He who comes later, break it, pass it around. Mm. And that's when Yeshua took the cup, the cup of redemption. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Shed for the remission of the sins of many. Drink this as often as you will. When you do, do this in remembrance of me. He instituted the new covenant with the matzah, symbol of the lamb, and the wine, the third cup, the cup of redemption that points me right back to the freedom from Pharaoh and the dripping blood of lambs. And he said, this cup is in my blood. Mm. The new covenant, it's an odd phrase, isn't it? It's only found one time here in the record of the Older Testament, and that's by the prophet Jeremiah who said, behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the Jewish people. Not like the covenant I made with them when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, the one they broke, but this is the covenant I'll make with them. I'll put my law in their heart. I'll forgive mm. their sins. They'll all know me. That's what Jesus instituted here for you and for me, the new covenant. It's available for all people. And if you have received him, then the cup of praise is natural, the cup mm. of hallel. There's one more cup that we don't drink from. It's the cup of Elijah. At the end of the Seder, the youngest child opens the door and hopes to see someone. We all stand for him. Elijah, he will come. But he's already come. Wow. Yeshua said, John the Baptist is Elijah. Mm. He's come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And here he was in the River Jordan and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, pointing to Jesus. He takes away the sin of the world. That's what you need to know. Mm. Behold, don't miss it. Don't miss, don't let anything else get in your way. Don't look at what you're doing by the which you think you're religiously qualified to get to heaven. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold what God did in sending his son. It wasn't about one lamb getting out one family from another geopolitical place. It was about one lamb dying for the sins of the world. And by that death on the cross in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago, Jesus provides access for you to get to heaven. You can have death pass over you and you can be forgiven and know him personally. How great is that? That is so wonderful. I mean, I think this was what gripped me about the story of the Lord Jesus, that he has offered himself for us. He has taken our place, our punishment, so that we can know God and be with him forever. Bob, thank you for this wonderful demonstration. Thank You're you welcome. for your time. Pleasure. To our viewers, we really hope that you've enjoyed learning, if you've never seen this demonstration before, about finding out Christ in the Passover, how it is that this feast reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please stay in tune for the very next episode as we discuss John chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus. And may God bless you.